the practice of eliminationism and mass annihilation politics in Kenya ought to stop. Kenyans need politicians of substance and principle. Tribal, ethnic, and clan kind of politics ought to stop for a better tomorrow. The culture of it is our time to eat ought to stop. Discrimination in allocation of resources and employment opportunities ought to stop. Most young people who are disillusioned with the systematic culture of corruption and tribalism end up joining terrorist groups like the Al Shabaab. The political rhetoric shapes our most compelling options in confronting the terrible human reality of genocide. And the political rhetoric in Kenya may lead to genocide if not stopped. The targeted killings of fellow Kenyans ought to stop, and this can only be achieved by one, breaking the culture of silence. Two, educating Kenyans about our moral human dignity. Three, understanding the positive role of outside intervention. The human rights and social justice education is of paramount importance in Kenya more than ever before. Without education, the limited mental scope provides a viable template for the social manufacture of injustice and oppression. The jailing of a Kenyan blogger, Alan Wadi Okengo, known as Wadi, for insulting President Uhuru Kenyatta on social media has ignited a fierce national debate on the freedom of expression and its limits. Another blogger, Robert Alai, was also charged recently for undermining President Uhuru Kenyatta by posting an annoying tweet. Interestingly, Moses Kuria, who has been accused of the same, if not more serious crimes, continues to spread hate speech and is untouched by the same government. This is a good example of double standards, indeed, and selective use of law to punish the ones you perceive as your political enemies and reward psychophant supporters by protecting them from prose prosecution. The government can also use the regime's ideological guardians, like the Mosese couriers who tend to reason like an educated village imbeciles, using bigotry for attention to rise to national political power. What a fallacy. The opposition party being outnumbered and the government side riddled with the rise of psychophancy and the death of logic in the debates in parliament, Kenyans are left to wonder where their beloved country is heading, if not a banana republic. Some of the staunch government sycophants resorting to social media as bloggers to spew hate speech and ethnic hatred. One classic example is Mosese Kuria, who has risen from obscurity as a pajama blogger spreading hate propaganda against the low ethnic community who he perceives to be political enemies of his ethnic quill who have dominated Kenya politics all along. Kuria, Larry has a bit more on that. Yes, Max Mariti, this is an important and interesting one because for the first time we're seeing somebody being investigated for hate speech on social media. Moses Kuria is familiar to many people, TV viewers. He's a regular commentator on political affairs. He's largely believed to be um, affiliated to the Jubilee Coalition. And now the deputy, the, the Law Society of Kenya has demanded that he be investigated and the DPP's office has gone ahead to do that, the Director of Public Prosecutions, today ordering, uh, today having him investigated. Because of this post from Monday, he said a lot of things reacting to the court rally over the weekend. Perhaps the interesting one here is... Um, those are things we have, we have to allow court to say now and then to save them from depression that comes the hard trick of electoral losses. We need them alive so we have someone to defeat yet again. It's a very long post. 
However, it has 448 people who like it, and there are 525 people who've commented on this post since Monday. It has turned to be quite controversial, and this is a screenshot that the LSK sent to the DPP's office. This is what it says. Uh, one of the comments that came from Moses Courier was this over here. You, you don't coordinate terrorist attacks on Boston and get away with it. You know who's in Boston right now? The leader of CORD, Raila Odinga, who was Prime Minister and reigned for President. And the other controversial comment from Moses Korea in the comments of that post is this one who says, um, Kofi Ambaya said it's not Somalis throwing grenades, it's Odiambos. And Moses Korea responded, Kofi, we will kill them both. And perhaps that is the most controversial one. If you look through this post, those two comments have been deleted. They're no longer there. But Moses Kuria is saying, and I spoke to him a short while ago, he says he will not take down this post because he stands by it and everything that's in there. So it's an interesting conversation. The fact that the DPP, this is what they are charging him with, and these are the important ones. They say it was hate speech and especially inciting a specific community to violence. Those are the two main concerns that uh, they have against him, inciting the public to violence, targeting a specific community, and hate speech, which may plunge the country into chaos. And it's something that the DPP appears to have reacted to very quickly. This was the letter the LSK sent from the chairman, from the secretary, actually, Apollo Mboya. Apollo Mboya. And he said, we hereby attach a download from the Facebook wall of Moses Korea together with comments there too, which has been brought to our attention by concerned members of the public. And this is the letter now out of Kiriako Tobago's office today ordering that Moses Korea be investigated. So something that's developing and we'll see how this ends. Incidentally, Moses Korea will be live with me on the trend tomorrow. And he, we can basically get to hear from him firsthand. But people need to watch what they say on social media because now it seems the government is looking at that as well. Especially, like the LSK says, when concerned members of the public bring it up. Yeah. Right. All right. Larry. Political rivalry between Lewis and Kikuyu's death to Kenya's independence and the likes of Moses Kuria are ready to exploit that rivalry to the maximum for their selfish political ends. Moses Kuria was elected to parliament unopposed uh, in a by election as a Gatindu member of parliament last year a constituency of President Uhuru Kenyatta, which he represented in the past as a member of parliament. In fact, there was no election. He was just selected. We're back now for the final part of my conversation with the MP for Gatundu South, Moses Kuria. You're MP according to the law, but you're not really elected, why are you? Well, I was elected and opposed. You were not elected. There was no vote cast in your name. Being elected is not a question of voting. I mean, which part of the law do you read? The election, election as a word, as an element of voting. Yeah, this is, so why is it not called, you, you are not voted? You are selected. I mean, by who? That, that, I, that. I, I offered myself mm -hmm. for election as a member of parliament for Katundo South. I was nominated, nominated by my party. I waited for an opponent. There was none. So what do you call No, there that? was an opponent. The opponent dropped out. Yes. And Kerry Kamere said for the sake of peace Absolutely. and in respect for Absolutely. the president. Absolutely. Absolutely. Does that mean that I'm not elected? Are you satisfied? I am actually, actually elected by the 58,000 voters of Gatondo South, all of them. And I would want you to go and give N me not one. Not technically. No, no. I would want you to go and produce one who didn't vote for me. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> what because, do you mean? No, because all of them voted for me. They did not. They did not. On the day you were supposed to have been, they should, well, the day that should that, have been the by-election that, that, that's, that's, that's on how, Thursday. That's how Gatondo people. You are already MP. That's how Gatondo people are, Ali. And I'll, I'll take you on a trip there when you are not working. Yeah. When they decide, they decide. They decide collectively. They decide in cons with consensus and with maturity. Are uh, you satisfied with this brand of democracy? Yes. Why not? And uh, you know what is going to happen going forward. Eh? You're going to see a lot of this that if a party has got a stronghold in a particular area, once you are through with the nomination, you should even be free to go and uh, campaign for a candidate in another area that, that is not, that may be a swing vote or mm -hmm. something like that. It, it's, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a future of where we are going, but that is not strange, you know. In California, the state of California, once you are nominated by the Democratic Party, you are as good as in the Congress. That's, that's what happens. However, they still go through the process of doing the election, mm -hmm. even though it's a Democratic stronghold, so if, that if the, pe the people's voice is seen to have been heard. And there's some instances where there, there has not been candidates, even in California, and elections have not been called. Mm -hmm. Moses Ekuria, therefore, has an ear to the president and considers himself part, of a, part and parcel of the tribal cartel and kitchen cabinet. 
Despite being restrained by the court from making statements that amount to incitement to violence and ethnic violence, Moses Ekuria has ignored all this and continues with his hate speech, particularly directed to the local community and the Muslims. Is this a classic example of a village tyrant turned national politician being mesmerized by the power he perceives to have by his connection to the ruling class to bully others to submission? Moses Ekuria is so possessed with the circumcision issue, a cultural practice that is not practiced by other tribes in Kenya, but in his twisted mind, wants to enforce it on other tribes in order to qualify to lead Kenya. The late or late Nobel Peace Prize winner single-handedly opposed the construction of a project at Uhuru Park. I'm proud uh, to say that the political party, uh, Liberal Party of Kenya, which I formed with my colleagues, sponsored her as a presidential candidate in the 1970, 1997 general elections. <clears throat> but according to the Gospel of Moses Ekuria, one has to be circumcised to lead Kenya. Of course, it is figments of his own imagination and is laughable to say the least. Kenya should not be silenced by the likes of Moses Ekuria, Adam Dwale, and the likes in leadership positions who continue to use their positions to scare critics and those with differing opinions. The culture of silence perpetuates reign of social injustice. The post-election violence in Kenya after the 2007-2008 disputed general election is still fresh in the minds of Kenyans. Over 1,300 people were killed and over 600,000 people were displaced. The internal displaced persons, the IDPs, are yet to be resettled by the government and remains homeless to date, unfortunately. The violence in Kenya's Rift Valley region is spreading quite fast. This is Naivasha, about 100 kilometers west of Nairobi. It is the latest to be hit by the ethnic violence gripping this country. Armed groups on a revenge mission attacked this house belonging to a Luo, opposition leader Raila Odinga's community. The occupants and some of their neighbors had sought refuge inside from the violent youth. They now lie dead, their bodies still burning. Inside the town, police engaged gangs in running battles as soldiers struggled to remove the roadblocks. There was little traffic on the Nairobi-Naivasha Highway, one of the country's major arteries. The few vehicles plying the road were stopped and searched for members of some ethnic communities. <coughs> Using machetes and other crude weapons, the youths meted out brutal violence on anyone they found. There are now fears that the cycle of attack and revenge is already beyond the control of the security forces. Flying over Naivasha, we saw the devastation caused by the violence in the town, a popular tourist destination. Naivasha is also at the heart of Kenya's multi-million dollar flower industry. In nearby Nakuru, the lawlessness continues. Houses continue to be torched as armed youth run amok. The displaced, frightened and desolate seek protection. Here, hundreds of families have sought refuge in a church. It cannot accommodate them all, and many have to live in the open. The Kenya army deployed to quell the violence tries to help some of the displaced get away from the misery. We are in Afraha Stadium in Nakuru, which is home to thousands of people displaced from their homes. They have with them the little they manage to salvage from their destroyed houses. And here, those who have just arrived are queuing to register. They will have to do so, or else they don't get any help. Rose Hamoye is lucky to be alive. Her home was destroyed by armed gangs who killed some of our neighbors. Banga. They came with machetes and were slashing people to death. I saw a schoolboy, his head was split in two. They were burning the houses of those that they killed. We've seen horrors here. The displaced are well guarded in the stadium, but it's all they have. They have little to eat and no shelter from the rains and cold nights. I've had nothing to eat all day. 
We cannot go out and buy any food, and we've consumed all we had. We just need to be taken away from here to our rural homes. And the government is struggling to bring the bloodshed to an end. We caught up with the Rift Valley Provincial Commissioner just before he embarked on another aerial survey of the situation. The situation is tense in the town here in Nakuru. At the outskirts, we have been able to maintain the security and the things will, be, will cool down. Of course, things are tense, but I'm sure we'll be able to overcome it. And as the violence continues, the displaced in Nakuru are too afraid to go home. Some say they will wait here for calm to return. But for others, what they've just witnessed is just too harrowing, and they say they just want a safe passage out of the town. Mohamed Adu Al Jazeera, Nakuru, Kenya.